In this section uh, of John 1, 35 to 42, we know that uh, Jesus calls his first disciples. So John the Baptist introduces Jesus to his disciples as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The context of the Lamb of God, of course, is that is found in the Old Testament, where we learn about the sacrifice that priests were making on behalf of the people. They would sacrifice lambs, and, and there's different animals that are discussed in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and so on. And they would, they would sacrifice the lambs to atone for the sins of the people, or the transgressions of the people. There are more details in the first five books of the Bible as regards to the sacrifice and how things were done back in the Old Testament. It is interesting to note, though, however, that Abraham's story in Genesis about trusting God comes to mind here. In Genesis chapter 22, we learn about the time when God calls Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac. Then God stops Abraham when he's about to go through with what he's been called to do. And we're told, of course, that God counted Abraham's um, obedience and faith. He counted it, uh, counted, he said Abraham was justified by faith. Hebrews 11, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible, also talks about this. So we see the role that the lamb plays. And we see, uh, you know, God set in the stage right from the Old Testament for a time where a lamb will come, the final lamb that will take away the sin of the world. Now, John also talks about this lamb in the book of Revelation, where he sees the lamb. So this is a very important part of Christianity, and I believe that it's worth our time to dissect it and to discuss it more. So as we'll see in the book of John, God did not spare his own son, but gave Jesus to be the sacrifice, of course, in John 3, 16, we're told. So the first theme we're looking at right now is what Jesus is called, the Lamb of God. That's a very powerful name that John is using, and we're going to pause and dissect that now. The second theme we're looking at is what Andrew does. So it says, um, Jesus went with them, but then what do we know about Andrew? They say one of the people that followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, and he brought him to Jesus. So let's dissect this theme now for a second. Whether we're talking the book of John or apologetics or whatever it is we're looking at in this discussion, I want to tell you one of the biggest problems we have in America and in the world, frankly, in many cases, and that is the problem of shallow conversations. I think that people will rather have conversations about things that don't matter than things that carry weight. Why is this point important? Because they said that when Andrew met Jesus, what did he want to do? He wanted to talk about Jesus and he went and called Simon. So here's my question for us today, and especially to young people. How often are we, like when we, we encounter something, how often are we willing to talk about the thing we've encountered, right? I found some apps that are very helpful on the iPad, for example. I'm going to tell everybody about this. This app is great. You should use this app. It's one of the best things you can have. And so we're excited to talk about the things that we think matter. Well, this is a lesson for all of us. How then do we carry these things that we're learning whether it's from the book of John or from apologetics, how are we doing in carrying that to other people that we care about? Because it seems to me that many people are comfortable with just talking about the weather and about things that cannot be changed. As a matter of fact, I think about conversations people have sometimes, and I say that those conversations are so, um, like they're so pre-programmed that you might as well have not had them, right? How are you? Good. How's your day? Good. The weather is nice. Yes. Goodbye, goodbye. Like, that conversation didn't need to happen. Nothing was said in that conversation. Uh, now, I'm not saying people ask you how you're doing and you start talking about the atom. No, but the point is, how about you try to figure out a way to really get real and, and try to get, I mean, you only have one minute in the elevator, right? For example, how can we have a conversation that actually matters? How, how, how is life going? What are you making of this pandemic? What are your thoughts? Whatever. Now we're talking about things that matter. So we're going, to take, we're going to pause and I definitely want to hear your thoughts on this. Because when Andrew met Jesus, he wanted to talk about Jesus, right? But somehow it seems that many people today would rather talk about, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, fluff or things that just don't matter. Rather than talking about things that can help us grow. Um, and this is of course going to happen as we study apologetics. Someone says, hey Amos, what's new with you? Well, um, I've been reading a book and it's really interesting that it talks about this in the book. Well, now we've opened a whole can of, okay, where's that going to go? I don't know, but at least I've shared with them a fact, right? I'm reading a book about can science explain everything? And I think it's interesting. The author talks about the fact that science cannot explain everything. What do you think? Well, now we have to deal with a heavy conversation. So Andrew saw something that mattered and he didn't keep it to himself. 
Why do we sometimes keep truth to ourselves that can help somebody else in a mighty way? That is something we all have to learn how to deal with. There are truths that we learn about, and I know they say people don't like controversy and so on and so forth, but sometimes it's, it's not going into all the details right on the spot, but it's beginning a conversation. And so as we learn about science and philosophy and apologetics and everything that we learn from John, one of my encouragements is how can we share that with other people, especially if it resonates with us. Don't be afraid to share that with people because you never know. I'll tell you a quick story and then I'll take your comments. I went to a, one day I was driving from my house to a city um, out in central Minnesota and my car stopped. It just stopped working. Um, and so I had to take it to a, a garage to have it fixed. One of my weaknesses is cars. I don't know about cars and it's just sad, but it's just life. Um, when I look at the hood, when you open the hood, it's just like, nope, I'd rather not look at any of this. Let's just hand it to somebody who knows what's there. Uh, can I learn? Sure, you can learn everything, but I, I, I'd rather help support the economy, I guess. So I, I, I gave the car to someone to fix, and somebody was in the, in the uh, uh, what do you call it, the mechanic shop, and I asked him, how are you doing today? And his response to me was, I am blessed, or something like that. And I thought, that's strange. I'm blessed or I'm hopeful. And I thought, that's a strange answer. And I automatically went from, how are you today? When he said hopeful and so on. And I literally went to the next question. So what fellowship or what church are you a part of? Now, you would wonder, why did I do that? Well, because why would you be hopeful? Why, why would you be hopeful about it? You know, the, the state of affairs? His answer told me something about him. And we just began to talk. That family was not it was at our house not long ago. We built friendships and all that with their family or their children. And so it's interesting that it all started with one, one comment. How are you doing today? I'm hopeful, right? That's more meaningful than I'm good. What does it mean to be good? I, I don't understand. I, I know what it generally means, but that's, that can lead to a lot of small talk or end talk. You know, it just ends the conversation. Someone trying to have a conversation, that ends it. So part of my challenge to us this week is... How are we doing today? Let's try and give people a different answer and see how it goes. And then maybe we can report back. But we need to have deep conversations. We need to have conversations that matter. But that doesn't happen overnight. It happens with practice. We don't just start having deep conversations. We, we practice the art of having good, deep conversations. I don't know if that makes sense. And so I want to take a second to pause and have us discuss the importance of sharing something that matters to us like Andrew did by telling his brother Peter. So let's go ahead and first of all, have you noticed the small talk generation? John the Baptist recognized the Lamb of God and he declared it to his disciples. Now what's interesting is that he was willing to let go of them to follow Jesus, right? Now how willing are we sometimes to not be the point of recognition, right? Sometimes it's okay to take that, to step back and point people in the direction they ought to go. And that's what John the Baptist did here where he told his disciples, this is the Lamb of God, and then they followed Jesus. The topic of a disciple, of course, is very important. We'll see this come up many times, or we see it many times in the Gospels. Jesus called specific people to be his disciples while he was on earth. They came from different works of life, fishermen, tax, the tax collector, and so on and so forth. He called both the literates and illiterates, it says in Acts 4.13. They were not experts in the law when he called them, but he called them nonetheless, and they were willing to follow. Today we can be disciples of Jesus if we receive his gift of eternal life, which is found in John 1.12. And as, my, as Brother Bob Lubeck put it, he said a disciple is one who learns about Jesus from Jesus through a relational attachment with Jesus. So one who learns about Jesus from Jesus through a relational attachment with Jesus. And as we study the book of John, and I can, I'll share these notes on our page also. As we study from John, one thing that is important is for us to realize that if we are disciples of Jesus, then we will be willing, we should be willing to share about what he's teaching us and what he's done in our lives. So we live in a day and time, again, when it is hard for people to have meaningful conversations. However, uh, we notice people rather talk about sports, the weather, cars, games, and so on. None of these things are bad in of themselves, right? Except if it depends on the sport. If we're talking about NASCAR, I can't be your friend, okay? But generally, those things are okay. They, they, well, they, they, they have limits, right? And I have to be careful. Not all of them are fully okay. But the point is, the problem is not that we can't have hobbies. That's what we need to understand. The problem is when the hobbies consume our conversation all the time. That's where we have a problem. That means that our lives are wrapped around something else. Remember, Jesus is the center of our lives, or should be, if people say they follow Jesus. And when my hobby, when golf, when tennis, when basketball becomes my life, 
Now my life is not going to make sense. It can only make sense with Jesus at the center. So as we study from the book of John, this is partly an introduction to the rest of the book of John. I want to encourage us again to just be ready. Be ready when people have those questions and those comments and those opportunities where people have, um, you know, questions about how you do it. What are you learning? I hope that we can share with them the things that we're learning. So how often do we um, hear people sharing with one another about the things they are learning from the one true king and the Lamb of God? My hope and prayer is that they can hear that more and more. And, uh, and how often do people hear others sharing about the one from whom uh, we say we are disciples of? If we say we're disciples of Jesus, that means we're following him, we trust him, and we should share about him. Jesus mentions in several passages what it takes to follow him. And I think it's important at this point to distinguish between truth and falsity. The thing about truth, philosophically speaking, is that you can only have one version of it. And you can't have many versions of that thing, especially the ones that negate the thing in question. Why is this important? Because you can have many false versions of something. But you can't have many true versions of something, especially if some of the versions are uh, opposite to one another. The guy who came up with the law of non-contradiction, or one of the people that we cite, is Aristotle, by the way. Remember Socrates, Plato, Aristotle? Aristotle um, would be one of those, I think, we put in the category of um, establishing truth, truth tables for uh, the law of non-contradiction. And what we would realize is that if there is a true disciple, which we see in the Bible talked about in Luke 9, 23, uh, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Uh, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So if there's true disciples, that means there's false disciples. If there's truth, that means there's falsity. That's just the fact of life. And I've heard people say, no, it doesn't have to be that way. We can always have all the answers correct. Well, the problem is you lose essence of truth if everything is true, including things that are invalid. So truth stands alone. And now let me explain one thing about truth that might be a little interesting to dissect. When something is true, it is true on its own terms, not because its truth negates something else. So let me explain. When I was in philosophy of science, there were people that said, the reason why creation, you guys believe creation is true, is because you somehow think you've proven evolution as false. And we're talking about macroevolution. So people say, the reason why a Christian might believe in creation is because they somehow think that evolution has been proven false in their view, therefore creation has to be true. And I had to explain, actually, that's not why I believe creation is true. I don't believe creation is true because evolution is false. That's not why I believe creation is true. Because they, then they're putting it only side by side. If this is false, this must be true. So then they do it the other way. Well, we believe evolution is true because creation is false. Well, truth doesn't need the other to be false. It needs to be true and stand alone. And then all the other versions of falsity will have to be shown to be false if you wanted to take the time to show them. But the truth is the truth, not simply because something else is false. And that's very important. Because when we talk about science and Christianity, it's very important that we remind people that the truth is the truth, not because of the falsity of something else. And we're going to talk about this issue. It's going to come up and we're going to dissect it more. Before um, this week, I actually was thinking a lot about talking about evolution and creation just in a, in a podcast series. And the reason why I wanted to do that is I wanted to lay it out there. All, a lot of the discussions, a lot of the papers I've written and a lot of things I've studied just to help people in the culture. Because in today's world, most people assume evolution is true. That's in the general public. Most people just assume that if you're educated, that evolution is the only way. Well, we need to sit down and ask some questions. We need to look at this, you know, we need to step back and analyze what is this thing we're talking about? The, Christ, the Christian and the non-Christian talking about creation and, and evolution. And we need to break it down. Now, there are some Christians who are of a view called theistic evolution. We're not going to get into all that today, but there are people who are Christians who also believe in evolution. So dissecting the issue of evolution is one that takes, you know, sitting down, breaking down what a person is saying, and then being able to respond accordingly. And we will discuss that. But the point I wanted to make from all of this is to remind us that a true disciple of Jesus Christ has a definition such that you can be a true disciple or you can be a false disciple. Anytime the word true disciple is used or true something, that means they can be a false version of it. And so that's where in our world where people don't want to dig deep, Christians and people who love to think need to pause 
and ask themselves the tough questions. And so Jesus called these people to follow him. There was a way to follow him in truth. And there is a way to follow him in falsity. What do I mean by falsity? If I say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm going to do whatever I want to do, right? Then this is one of the last things I want to leave us with today. But if someone says, I want to follow Jesus, but I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Well, then am I following him? That's the question. And our culture says, and I'm serious. I've had this conversation with many people. People have actually told me, I can do anything I want to do and be called a disciple. Well, that's a challenge if we try to look at that. How can we say we're a disciple of someone who we're not willing to follow? Well, then we're not a disciple. Well, now we have a contradiction. And, and this is very important because if contradictions don't allow logic to flow, that's why mathematics is popular. Because mathematics tries to get rid of contradictions. Mathematics tries to keep in line with the laws of logic. And that's why people love it. Because math literally focuses on keeping things in line, inequality, and so on, I mean, and, so on and so forth. So truth is such that if, if, if somebody is a true disciple, then that means there is a way to be a disciple. So when Jesus called these people to follow him, he expected something from them. Well, welcome to our Western civilization of today, where we tell you, oh no, you can do anything you want and still call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. Well, we have a problem there because we are losing the essence of the definition of the thing in question. That's one of the topics we're going to dissect in more detail next week. But it's this issue of when he called them to be his disciples, what did he expect from them? And how can we learn from these people that were called to be disciples? So a disciple follows his master, learns from his master, and strives to follow the, what the master teaches. And we're talking of Jesus specifically. So one of the things Jesus taught about the kingdom of God and the free gift people can receive is, is this issue of there is a way to follow me and there is a way to be deceived in thinking that you're following if you're not paying attention and walking as, I, as I'm walking. So how are we doing with sharing what Jesus has given? And if we're following him, my hope and my prayer is that it should affect all our conversation. Well, it should affect all areas of our lives if we're true disciples. And this is a lesson that I need to learn every day. So when Jesus was leaving the earth, finally, and this is my final uh, paragraph, he called his disciples to make disciples. One sign that we are being disciples is that we're doing what he said we should do, which is to call others to follow him. The fundamental goal is not to get people to follow us. That's not my fundamental goal in life. It's to get them to follow Jesus. And I'm just a tool. I'm just a person pointing them in his direction. And they can learn from us. But we also need to remember that we are to filter. We are supposed to be a filter. And of course, Matthew 5, 16, let our light so shine that they may see our Father, uh, that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. That was a lot to chew on. But the point I want to make is in this passage from John 1, 35 to 42, Jesus calls us and tells us to, uh, he calls his disciples and of course calls them to follow him. That's my hope and my prayer is that we can call others to follow in his steps.